A white Zimbabwean farmer has been evicted by the state and the farm has been given to a new black owner who works in the Prime Minister's office. Now the move has left more than uh, about 120 workers without jobs and led to an investment worth of uh, about half a million US dollars going to waste. The eviction happened despite an invitation by the government to white farmers who were previously evicted from their properties to return to those farms. England at this juncture was not yet on a par with the leading continental European powers, either militarily or economically. It was backward in mining and in the production of metals, and much of its international commerce was carried in foreign ships. It was still an exporter of raw materials, such as wool and agricultural products. Flanders, for example, became a major textile center in continental Europe by importing British wool for centuries, before the British themselves finally began to process their own wool into cloth. Italian shipbuilders contributed to the development of the British Navy during the reign of Henry VIII, while imported German miners contributed to the development of the British mining industry, and Dutch engineers contributed to land clearance and to the development of waterworks. As medieval England began to become transformed into a money economy, finances were at first handled primarily by Jews and Lombards, with foreigners in general conducting financial transactions that Englishmen were not yet capable of handling. After the expulsion of the Jews near the end of the 13th century, the Lombards then conducted virtually all the major financial transactions of the kingdom until they too fell into disfavor and were subjected to restrictions and predations which drove them out of the English financial markets in the 14th century. Again, however, it was foreigners from the continent of Europe who took over money lending, tax collection, and other financial transactions that produced both wealth and unpopularity. However, by the time that these latter-day financiers also fell into disfavor, there were now Englishmen able to handle financial markets, often using methods introduced by successive waves of foreigners. One relic of the era of foreign domination of English financial markets is the name of Lombard Street in modern London's financial district. In industry, as in commerce and finance, England's early economic development owed much to foreigners, and to its own stability of government and dependability of laws, which attracted foreigners. The Dutch, the Walloons, and the Flemings were among the many foreigners who brought their skills to England with them. As of 1618, there were 10,000 skilled foreign workers in London alone. Refugee groups such as Jews, Huguenots, and Flemings, all seeking respite from persecution on the continent, played key roles in England's emergence from being a backward part of Europe's economy to becoming one of its economic leaders. Between 50,000 and 100,000 Huguenots fled to Britain from France in the 17th century, particularly after revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which had previously guaranteed religious freedom to Protestants. Even earlier, however, Huguenot watchmakers had turned London from a city where no watches were manufactured to one of the leading watch-producing centers of the world. The British woolen, linen, cotton, silk, paper, and glass industries were likewise revolutionized by foreign workers and foreign entrepreneurs. Moreover, as these immigrants settled and were absorbed into the English population, their skills diffused and influenced Englishmen, who now began to make their own contributions to the process. The 14th and 15th centuries marked a turning point in England's evolution from an exporter of raw materials to a producer of finished products. The country's leading export ceased to be wool and became woolen cloth. During the second half of the 14th century, England's exports of raw wool dropped by half, and its export of cloth increased more than sevenfold. In production processes in general, however, England was still importing technological advances from continental Europe until the late 17th century, when the tide began to turn in this respect as well. By the early 18th century, the net flow of technological advances was from the British Isles to the continent, and thereafter Europe and the world continued copying and adapting British technology for most of the next two centuries. Profound and sweeping changes in technology, in the economy, and in the society were all interrelated with one another. The first great industry to emerge in Britain was the textile industry. Initially a cottage industry, 
Cloth production in later centuries became a pioneering sector in the Industrial Revolution. The machines invented and developed in this industry, the spinning jenny, the mule, the flying shuttle, pioneered machine building in general, creating a whole class of mechanics and inventors whose skills and examples would prove valuable to heavier industry later on. The use of water wheels to tap the power of rivers and streams for turning factory machinery set the stage for applying the power of the epoch-making steam engine that would revolutionize factories, mines, railroads, and ships. While the use of water power attracted industry and workmen to places where rivers and streams could be tapped, so the later emergence of coal-fired steam engines attracted industry and workmen to places where coal deposits were found. The escalating importance of coal was reflected in the dramatic rise in the amount of coal extracted from the earth. Two million tons at the beginning of the 18th century, ten million tons before the end of that century, and more than 64 million tons by the middle of the 19th century.